Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime's session on bus operator accessible information regulations and the support grant that Arctic has. Uh, I'm Tim Rivett. I'm going to uh, run you through the uh, the regulations and the uh, grant this lunchtime. Um, we are recording this and the uh, recording will be circulated uh, in the next couple of days along with the slides um, for you to share with colleagues and, and whoever might not be able to make it today. Um, please do feel free to use the chat function. Um, uh, this is to an extent about the questions you've got uh, and uh, the help that you need to uh, to meet the regulations and apply for the grant. So. Uh, we're going to have a look at why the regulations have been bought in, uh, have a quick look at the regulations and what they say, and then look at the support that is available and we'll open up for questions. So why have the accessible information regulations been bought in? Um, back in about nine uh, 2000 and uh, 15, 16, there was quite a campaign by the Guide Dogs for the Blind in particular and some other um, uh, organi accessibility organisations to introduce uh, more accessible information, in particular on vehicle. Um, and um, that's because um, particularly for people with impairments, be it uh, now, visual impairments, hard of hearing, a learning disability, cognitive impairment, whole range of different um, challenges that people might have um, means that travel is really quite high anxiety. Um, they they need the confidence that where they are is where they you know it's supposed to, to end up. Um, they're on the right bus and things like that. And, and even as somebody um, that's got no obvious disabilities, myself, uh, it's um, quite a challenge sometimes to travel to places where you've never been before, you know, constantly checking information. Am I on the right bus? Am I at the right bus stop? Um, even for me, uh, these things can be uh, quite anxiety inducing. So if you've got visual impairments and things like that, you can just imagine how much worse it is. Um, there was a survey back in 2014, which triggered to an extent this, uh, the push where 70% um, of people when they were asked, uh, they said they'd missed their stop because the bus driver had forgotten to tell them that, uh, that it was the stop that they'd asked for not understand not you know um quite easy to um understand that drivers uh, they've got lots of people getting on and off how do you can you remember everybody all of the time and you know fundamentally they're there to uh, to drive the vehicle um and um if there was audio visual announcements then uh, they would travel more people with disabilities travel less than people without generally anyway. And so uh, anything that can be done to encourage more uh, passenger use, particularly amongst those that really need it, uh, is a good thing. Um, it was adopted in London over 15 years ago. If you've been in London since then, you will have seen the buses with uh, displays and announcing the next stop. If you've been on a uh, new train since 1998, so uh, the last 26 years, you will have seen audiovisual announcements in action on trains. Um, so it's not new and it's been proved that it can be done. Um, and um, because the levels of adoption outside of London in particular have been uh, fairly slow. Uh, the Department of Transport felt that they needed to regulate to make adoption happen. Um, in England, only 49% of vehicles have got equipment as of uh, the end of 2023. 
um, outside of London. If you take London out of the equation, it's only 29 percent. Wales is uh, better at 37 and Scotland's 35. So you know, the majority of buses don't have uh, audio visual equipment, which is why the regulations have been brought in. So what do the regulations say you need to do? So if you run a local bus or coach service, then you need to be providing audible announcements and visual information, identifying the route and the direction and uh, the next stops and some other things like diversions and hail and ride and things like that. So um, it's applicable to buses and coaches operating across the UK um, where you're operating a local bus service. So uh, local bus service is not necessarily just a service that's registered with the DVSA as such because uh, things like a rail replacement service might fall under the local bus service definition if you're doing a, you know, a branch line or something like that with with stops where you know they're less than 15 miles apart um, if it's long distance then um, it's not going to be but as long as at least 50 percent of that route is uh, short local bus service type um, stopping patterns, then you are covered by the regulations. So it's not just registered services. Um, there are some exemptions um, which are fairly standard um, for these sort of things. So there are, if you've got very small vehicles, less than 17 passengers, then uh, those vehicles are exempt. Uh, if it's what you might class as a heritage vehicle, so first used before January 73, uh, then you're exempt uh, and the normal closed door home to school services, long distance services uh, and demand responsive elements of routes. Um, if you've got a route where uh, you've got normal, regular, fixed route, fixed timetable, and then it does something more flexible and demand responsive type for part of it, then it's only that part that's flexible and demand responsive that's exempt. The normal uh, fixed route, fixed timetable uh, part is covered. Um, and if your community bus operator with vehicles that were in use before October last year, then you've also got an exemption. Um, these are England, Scotland and Wales, unlike bus open data requirements for BODS, which is England only. Um, these are England, Scotland and Wales. Um, so in a number of places, um, we talk about when things were, when a vehicle was first used, what does first used mean? That is when a vehicle was first used for a local bus service. Um, if you've acquired a vehicle from another operator, it's not when you first used it, it's when the first operator that had the vehicle first used it uh, for local public service. Um, so um, the um, regulations apply based on the age of a vehicle. If you've got a shiny new vehicle arriving after October this year, then you've got to have uh, audio visual equipment on the vehicle from first use. So some operators that have got orders in manufacturers backlogs uh, that have been there, you know, 18 months, 12 months, might not have ordered uh, equipment as part of the original order. Uh, you're going to need to make sure that they uh, are fitted before first use. Vehicles that are five years old, so October 2019 onwards, you've got to have those retrofitted by October this year. Uh, and the oldest vehicles up to 1973, you've got until 2026. Uh, so two years, uh, but that will soon go. 
Um, there are a um, number of vehicles, uh, as we've seen, that have already got equipment on. If you had a vehicle with audio and visual information on that was already in use by October last year, then you can uh, claim a partial compliance um, and you don't need to make the vehicle fully compliant with the regulations until October 2031. You do need to have um, audio and visual information. If you just had a screen with no audio announcements, then you need to add the audio in uh, to make the vehicle uh, fully compliant. But if you've got um, audio and visual, even if you don't meet uh, all of the regulations to the letter. So, for example, um, you might not have the alert noises that you need. Um, you might not be able to do diversions, for example. Uh, then you can claim um, partial compliance and you've got uh, longer to uh, update those to be able to uh, to fully meet the requirements. So what do you need to do? Um, you need to provide audio information and we'll come on to what information you need to provide. You need to provide audio across both decks if it's a double decker or uh, uh, the whole deck if it's um, a single decker. Um, it's got to be loud enough to be understood and that's been defined as at least three decibels over the background noise for at least 51% of seated passengers. Um, but you don't need to um, go to the level of making it concert loud because uh, you have a maximum uh, level of 84 decibels that you're allowed. Um, now, why 84 decibels? Where does that come from? Um, that is actually enshrined in health and safety uh, regulations. So um, if you expose people to more than 84 decibels on a regular basis, so think like your bus drivers, your engineers and people like that, um, then you need to be providing them with um, hearing protection. So we don't want to fall foul of that. So that's where the 84 decibels comes from. Um, so it's got to be loud enough to be intelligible. Um, the recommendation is that the that is tested at uh, not just stationary, but also at five and 20 miles an hour to give some uh, realistic um, uh, real world testing to make sure that people can hear it and understand it. Um, as well as audio through speakers, you need to be providing information through an induction loop for those people that uh, have hearing impairments and have got a hearing aid with a T-switch. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the, uh, the symbols around in banks and shops. Um, so you need to be providing a hearing loop for them to use uh, in the priority and wheelchair space at least. Uh, you probably want to consider wider coverage in that providing the whole uh, footplate of the vehicle, for example, because hearing aid users won't often uh, necessarily use the um, the priority seats and things like that, because it's sometimes felt that, you know, uh, I don't need those. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a particular disability. It's just some uh, some hearing loss. So uh, think about coverage wider than the minimum of the priority in wheelchair space. Um, and you need to provide signage to let people know that it's there. To go along with the audio, you need to provide visual information. So you need uh, to put some displays on vehicle. You need to make sure that those are visible. Uh, in an unobstructed way to 51% of your seated passengers, both decks if it's a double decker. Um, uh, obviously, if the bus is uh, full standing room, chock-a-block, 
then uh, you're not going to be able to achieve that. The requirement is seated passengers uh, without anybody in the way. Um, there are various uh, criteria. The regulations generally, though, are technology agnostic. Uh, it doesn't specify whether you need to have LEDs, TFTs, plasmas, e-ink, whatever the latest technology is. Uh, you just need some form of display that's going to meet the requirements. Um, and so there are things like you know, it's got to be at least 22 millimetres high. Um, you shouldn't use all capitals because people find that hard to read. Uh, it's got advice about scrolling and, and things like that as well. So um, the requirement is to uh, provide a display for forward facing passengers. If you've got a new vehicle that's going to be first used after October this year, there is also an additional requirement for a display for people who are in the wheelchair bay who typically will be facing rearwards and so won't be able to see the display that um, passengers facing forward can use. So you need to put in something additional for those. Uh, you don't need to retrofit to existing uh, vehicles, but we know that some operators are, uh, and that would be good practice, but it's not required under the regulations. So you need to provide audio and visual. Um, what information do you need to provide? You need to provide route information. So people, uh, when they're boarding, know what the name or the number of the service is and where it's going to make sure that you know, they're getting on the right bus. If it's a circular service or you know similar where a destination you know is a bit different to you know a a single end point um, out and back type service, then provide the contextual information that helps people know. Uh, what direction the bus is going. So that might be, you know, town service clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, and before the end of the route, you need to uh, have an alert and tell people that it's the, uh, the last stop and they should be uh, preparing to get off. Um, while you're en route, uh, you need to tell people what the next stop is. Um, I should say that the route information only needs to be provided when people are boarding. So at the start of the route and when a bus is stopped with people boarding. Um, but while you're en route, you need to provide information about every stop that's coming up, whether or not you're going to stop there. Um, and um, that needs to be provided uh, once the vehicle has left the previous stop. Um, if you've got a long way to go between stops, you know, you're in a rural area, uh, it might be uh, a few miles between stops, then you might want to consider when you make that announcement, because if you announce it as soon as it leaves the last stop, uh, it could be uh, quite easy for people to uh, forget what the next stop is if it's a, you know, a couple of miles, so a few minutes. So you might want to consider uh, the announcement uh, as you're you know, heading towards the next stop rather than after the last one. Um, whatever, it should be timed so that um, a passenger can hear it understand it and press the button and the driver not have to make an emergency stop. Um, so, you know, think about the timing. Um, so, you know, rural, you've got long times between stops in a urban environment, particularly when you're leaving um, a uh, an urban centre, you might be, uh, you know, going out through uh, housing where you've got stops every you know three four hundred meters uh, and you might be traveling at a reasonable speed so you know 30 miles an hour for example then um, there's not a lot of time between stops if you're not actually stopping at those so you need to think about how you're going to achieve that announcement suppliers of these systems that 
you know they're all well aware of this but there's all sorts of configuration options and things like that available so you know talk to the suppliers have a think about the types of service that you run and how you're going to be able to uh, meet some of these requirements um, the name of the stops that you're announcing needs to be recognizable to people and consistent with other information that they might have got so if you've got an app make sure the names are the same if there's a name on the bus stop uh, then uh, make it consistent so that passengers have that confidence you know because if they've if they've planned a journey in advance and thinking you know i need to get off at a particular stop they're going to be listening for that name so just make sure that names are consistent this might be a good one for enhanced partnerships uh, to to tackle um, particularly where you've got sections of route that are common between operators you're going to need to make sure that uh, each of you are using the same name if you've got sections of route that are hail and ride you obviously haven't got a next stop in the same way so the requirement for hail and ride sections is that you uh, announce the beginning and end of the uh, hail and ride sections you've got to have a, an alert beforehand to wake people up and make them think aha hail and ride section um, if it's a long section then you might want to think about providing some more contextual information. Uh, we're at these crossroads, we're going through this village, um, just so people uh, are aware of you know, roughly where they are and therefore where they might uh, need to, uh, to get off along that section. And uh, inevitably, at some point, you're going to come across uh, a problem on the road network and need to have a diversion. Uh, if you, uh, you know, turn around a corner and find that the road's closed because there's been a water leak or, you know, the police have closed it off for whatever reason, uh, you're going to have to uh, have a way of alerting passengers to the fact that the vehicle's about to go on diversion. Um, and in those situations, the driver's going to have to play it by ear like they always do you know what route to take and things like that um, but if you know that the road's closed for resurfacing for a week then uh, the expectation is that you're going to be able to provide some more information uh, uh, which stops are being missed um, letting people know that the bus is about to go on diversion before it goes so that they can get off uh, if they need to, uh, and announcing when it's back on route again as well. Um, and I think this is one of those times where to ease the load on the driver, because uh, you know buses aren't clever enough yet to know when these, you know, when a bus is going off route and do something automatically um, to ease the load on the driver. If you've got a diversion that's going to be in place for a while, then you probably want to consider reprogramming the displays and updating your information on BODs and journey planners and apps and things like that to reflect the diversion, because then it's not a diversion, it's part of the short-term planned route. Um, now, typically at the moment, you might do that if you know you're going to have to do something different for six months, but you're probably not going to do that at the moment for a couple of weeks. Uh, you might want to reconsider that and think about how to uh, provide a uh, the, the necessary information to customers. Um, these audiovisual systems aren't just a case of fit and forget um, because you do need to make sure that they understand the routes that you're going on and if you change route, uh, then you're going to need to make sure that these systems are updated with the new route. Obviously, if you're just time changing timetable, then you don't need to do anything. But if you're changing route, then you do. So you need to be keeping on top of that. Um, you need to make sure that they're tested because it is an obligation to keep these things operational. So think about how you can test them. 
um, uh, a driver can uh, fairly easily give a quick check to check that the screen's working. They're going to notice whether the announcements are being made. The hearing loop, though, unless you've got a driver with a hearing aid and a T-switch, um, you're not going to necessarily know whether it's working or not. Some systems have got LEDs and things like that that uh, you can use and you can tell whether they're working or not, but uh, that just says whether they're technically working. Uh, is it actually intelligible to people? The only way you know that is by uh, doing some uh, some proper testing. So uh, get a tester. You can get little uh, devices that you can plug headphones into that uh, act as though it's a hearing aid and so you can listen into uh, to what's being announced. You obviously not going to be expected to be doing that every day but you know it should be part of some regular check uh, and uh, like any compliance based uh, requirement uh, any checks that you do uh, be it a driver you know doing a check when they first use the vehicle in the morning for example you should be uh having to uh you know record that so you've got an audit trail and you can prove that you know it's not working now um but it was yesterday when we did the check for example um and um you probably don't get too many complaints for from passengers at the moment about um uh, information on vehicle and things like that but audio and visual information is uh much more noticeable to uh, to passengers and so uh, you need to think about how you're going to handle those um, and the inevitable questions about that stop name's wrong and, and that sort of thing. Um, likewise, you know, drivers are going to need to report faults and things like that. Uh, and so think about that process. And so, my, my, oh, him, yeah, my, before my, we... Yeah get on to the support and the grant. Has anybody got any questions about regulations? Yeah, so my question was, um, you know the hearing loop, what you were saying, do they sell in the shop? Yeah, the hearing, the hearing loops need to um, have the same audio as would be coming out of a speaker. So they will announce the stops. Sorry? Where have we get you from? So there are a uh, number of suppliers of hearing loops available. Um, on the Artig website, we've got a pay. Uh, we've got a lot of information about the regulations. Um, one of the pages about the regulations has got uh, a list of suppliers who've let us know that they can provide compliant solutions. Um, there are other suppliers out there. They haven't let us know they can uh, provide solutions that meet the requirements. If you know of any, get them to get in contact with us and we'll add them to the list. But there's a couple of specialist loop suppliers there. Um, and uh, and some of the um, um, People uh, also provide displays and things like that and can provide the full solution. Uh, so, yeah, dual language in Wales. Um, you need to ask the uh, Welsh Assembly about that. My understanding is that the Welsh Language Act does apply to this. Um, it's certainly not excluded in the regulations and so therefore um, I believe it applies. Um, Transport for Wales are, have got more information, of course, uh, about the requirements and what you need to do um, and uh, where you get the Welsh stop names from and things like that. Um, does it also require disability people too? Can you explain what? you mean by that? No, well, like people are in wheelchairs. Yeah. Right. It is why people in wheelchairs also. So um if people are in the wheelchair bay then they need to be able to hear the information. If you're rearward facing there yeah. is a 
yeah, yeah. there is a there, there is a requirement for new vehicles from uh, October this year to have a forward facing display fitted but that's not a requirement to retrofit in the legislation um, so that only applies to newer vehicles but we do know that some operators are retrofitting forward facing displays but that's not a requirement in the regulations Okay, if there's no more um, questions about the regulations, I'll move on to the support that's available. So um, whenever new laws and regulations are being considered, uh, the department responsible has to carry out an impact assessment. Who are the winners and losers from it? What are the costs? of uh, complying with the regulations and what are the benefits um, as part of that impact assessment for these regulations the department of transport identified that there would be an adverse impact on the smallest operators um, partly because of the amount of uh, capital money available to uh, spend on uh, the equipment, but also uh, the fact that uh, you might need a back office, you might need training for engineers and things like that. Um, and if you've only got a small number of vehicles, the, the cost spread across the number of vehicles of that is going to be much greater for a small operator. And uh, they might have five vehicles than an operator across that's got 100, for example. And so as a result of that, um it found some money um to um provide a grant for small operators and they asked asat artig to um support them in the uh in the distribution and the process of uh, distributing that grant um and so uh we have uh, a bit over four and a half million pounds to support the smallest operators uh, in with the costs of uh, this equipment. So um, who is eligible? Um, you've got to have 20 or fewer in scope public service vehicles. So you, know, you might have some small mini buses and things like that. So you might actually have 30 vehicles, but as long as you've got less than 20 in scope of the regulations if they were used on public service uh, local bus services then um, you can apply um, you can't be part of a bigger group uh, for obvious reasons and um, the vehicles have got to be used on local services um, and not subject to uh, any of the uh, the exemptions um, and you can't already have both audio and visual information on board. If you've just got a display, for example, then uh, you can apply for audio um, and the applications need to come directly from uh, the operator. Uh, we've deliberately made this process as simple as possible. Uh, it's not the sort of application process that you might have seen for some government um, initiatives. You don't need to write war and peace about why you need it and the benefits and, and things like that. You just need to know information that hopefully you already know, like how many vehicles have you got? What's your own license? Um, what's your bank account details and things like that? Um, so um, what can you use the grant for as an operator? You can use it to buy the equipment, so displays, speakers and things like that. Um, to make sure that the funding goes as far as possible, uh, you can only use the grant for um, the minimum uh, specification or something that's going to meet the minimum requirements. You know, we're not going to uh fund you know surround sound audio systems on vehicles or you know 70 inch plasma screens at the front of a bus um 
So um, minimum specification, which practically is an LED display. Um, we recognize that you might decide that actually I want TFT because I can show more information. Uh, I can you know, perhaps have adverts on there and um, help fund some of the revenue cost through adverts and things like that. Um, and so because we recognize that, what we're asking you for um, as part of the application is uh, what would a uh, LED display cost to fit for that? Uh, tell us how much a TFT will cost, whatever what you really want, and we'll fund the, the minimum requirements and you fund the difference. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, equipment, installation, um, or training if it's your engineers that are doing it because we know that there's a challenge with some suppliers uh, not having the engineering resource to fit for a while. Um, any supporting infrastructure you might need. So a lot of this, you know, is software driven. Um, and so you, there might be a back office that you need to manage that information um, and the first year's maintenance. Um, so what do you need to do? What's the process for applying? You need to get your quote from a supplier. Um, we will be benchmarking those costs against uh, you know, other similar vehicles. Um, so you know, if you apply for uh, a vehicle and you're saying it's going to cost £50,000 to, to fit, then uh, we will be uh, asking you why, because you know, other operators for similar things are asking for you know, two grand or, or whatever the benchmark turns out to be. Um, there's a grant claim form that you need to fill out, you know, bank account details and things like that. Um, there are questions about size of fleet and you know, where you operate and things like that. Um, this grant is classed as a uh, subsidy under state aid rules. Um, and so uh, we do need you to tell us about any other state aid that you've received over the last uh, three years. So there's a form that you need to fill out to put that in. You might this is where you might need some help from uh, an accountant who might keep track of that for you. Um, but we uh, we can't give you a uh, grant that's going to take you over the state aid limit, unfortunately. So you know, we do need to keep track on that. Um, and there are some terms and conditions. So um, simple things like you're going to keep the kit working and maintained for five years after you've uh, first installed it. And we will have people going around uh, doing uh, checks on that. And we'll be asking you to uh, provide evidence on an annual basis of that. Um, but nothing too onerous uh, on the, in those uh, contract terms. Um, grants opened um, 8th of April um, and uh, at the moment the applications close on the 3rd of June, so a month away. Um, and all being well, a uh, decision will be made uh, and you'll get the nod um in early july um the only fly in the ointment there would be if there was a general election called um because uh civil service tends to shut down and whilst we're administering it we do need permission from the department of transport to uh, make the payments to you um in terms of how the grant will be allocated once applications are in um it's going to be based on the size of your fleet so um, the smallest operators uh, will get allocated uh, grant first uh, and will work up on size. Um, so um, if we're oversubscribed, the smallest operators will get uh, funding, whereas the larger ones uh, unfortunately might not. Um, but at the moment, um, the number of applications we've got um, means that um, you know, there's uh, yeah, we we need people to uh, apply, please. <laughs> we want to get rid of this money. Uh, so if you're eligible, please apply. Uh, OK, 
So um, you apply, um, you apply through um, a Department of Transport um, grant service process. You can get to that and find out all about the regulations and how to apply and all the links on the Arctic website. Um, we've got a whole series of pages on there um, with information about the grant and the regulations. Uh, we've got a dedicated uh, email address, aig at rtig.org.uk, um, where we'll, uh, you get a response uh, very quickly. If you've got any questions or need uh, support, um, if you've not, got audio visual equipment and don't know what it's about and uh, what options are available we've got a report available which talks about the different technologies um, what you need to think about planning your uh, implementation and uh, things about testing and that sort of thing so hopefully there's uh, all the information you need there but if there's not we've got the uh, dedicated email address to help you. Um, so any questions about the grant? So working upwards, what if the vehicle is sold within the five year period? Um, if you're not shrinking the fleet, then you'll need to make sure that the replacement vehicle also has uh, equipment on it. Now that might be buying new and you pass the equipment on to another operator. Um, or it might be uh, removing it uh, from an old vehicle if it's being scrapped and uh, refitting it to your new vehicle. Um, so the application process, um, uh, once operating license um, and what local authority areas you operate in, uh, just to make sure we've got those stats available, but it doesn't ask for route details per se. Um, so um, in terms of the post grant checks and validation, uh, Artig will be doing that. The DVSA are enforcement. If you've not got it equipment on and there's a compliance issue from that perspective, um, then that's part of the DVSA um, uh, work. But in terms of evidence that you've got the equipment and you're meeting the requirements of the grant, um, we'll be doing that on an ongoing basis. Um, so we've got some more further up. Um, so does it require, dis can, I ask, can any social worker get one? So so this is a grant for bus operators to put equipment on vehicle. This isn't a grant that individuals can apply for. Um, this is for things that actually go on the bus and stay on the bus for anybody to benefit from. OK. Are there any more questions? Um, no, so the NHS can't get it. It needs to be a bus operator. But if an NHS organisation is running a local bus service, then they could apply as that op if they've got the right operating license to operate a local bus service, um, but it's not something for individuals per se. OK, uh, is it local bus fleet size that considered? Yes, it is. It is. So you might have, um, you know, and it's also in scope vehicles. So uh, if you've got 30 vehicles and 15 of those are uh, eight seat minibuses, then um, you might still be able to apply. Um, and it's not the uh, the total O license that you might have.
Okay. Is there any other questions anybody's got? If not, um, then please do get in contact if there's anything that you think about later, either through the uh, dedicated email address or if you've got more general questions about the work that we do, please get in contact direct with me or the RT phone number is on the screen. Um, thank you all for your time uh, this lunchtime um and uh, have a good rest of the day and weekend uh, and uh, as i said at the start we'll circulate the slides and recording uh, to you as well thank you very much everybody thank you for watching this artig webinar to find out more about artig and our work then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.